Hi, now we are moving on to the next presentation of uh, session two. It is a panel discussion regarding a case of an infant who has jaundice since two months of age. The moderator of this session is none other than Dr. Nilam Mohan. She does not need more introduction, but she is the head of the Department of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Liver Transplantation in the Vedanta Medicity Gurgaon. And she is one of the pioneers uh, in establishing pediatric gastroenterology in India. She is an eminent speaker of international and national repute. So, and in the panel, we have two other speakers. The first one is uh, our guest speaker from US. He is Sanjeev Bhargavat. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology and Nutrition in Texas Children's Hospital, uh, as well as uh, Baylor College of Medicine. He has done his uh, graduation from Harvard Medical School and after that received his training and his special research interest is polystatic liver disease. So we are glad to get him amongst us today. Second panelist is Dr. H. S. Shomoshekhar, who is a consultant pediatric hepatologist and gastroenterologist in the Majumdar Shah Medical Center of Narayana Rudala Group in Bangalore. And he is a pediatrician. He has done his fellowship from King's College Hospital in London as well as from Birmingham. And I know him since he was doing his uh, fellowship in King's College Hospital. So without further delay, I hand over to Dr. Nilam Mohan to moderate the session. This was a young uh, a baby who was 66 uh, days old when the baby, 66 or 67, when the baby uh, came to me. And uh, surprisingly, I mean, this baby was from Delhi and the mother noticed jaundice close to two months of age. Uh, she said that she actually noticed jaundice soon after the birth and the baby was re received phototherapy and, you know, the bilirubin had dropped down to 11 or 12 and so were discharged. And they were told that sometimes jaundice persists for some time. So she didn't really work. But this was a mother who was like uh, 33, 34 years and was the first baby late marriage, etc. And uh, the moment she saw that, you know, the jaundice is not getting over, she thought it should get over. So 61 days, she goes to her pediatrician and the uh, pediatrician uh, uh, goes to a very high fi uh, a place in Delhi and he uses a bilirubinometer and says your total bilirubin is 9 which is okay don't worry any reassures her. So Somashekar would you have done the same thing or what do you think was missing? I slightly differ uh, Dr. Neelam um, you know it's the common practice in uh, especially with pediatricians to you know check a bilirubin and uh, reassure the parents and send them but uh, that would hold good for a neonatal jaundice, but not at day 61 of life. I mean, I, it's day 61 of life, persistent jaundice is little worrying. I mean, I would have probably done a, a, a split bilirubin. I would have estimated a total bilirubin. Absolutely. I would have. Exactly. It is unbelievable. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a blunder to do. At two months, a total bilirubin without a direct bilirubin. This child, this doctor thought he's saving a prick, but he did more harm. He did not actually do a direct bilirubin. So that was beautifully picked up by uh, Somashek. And so she comes to me uh, thinking that everything should be okay. And when I examine her, I find the liver 3.5, spleen 2 the baby's jaundice, and this was the diaper which we opened. So does that really make you worry? Dr. Sanjeev, are you worried with that? Uh, am I worried? The answer is definitely yes. So this is uh, interesting. It's a very common scenario that you present in India and you go across the world, the globe, and the exact same scenario plays out every day in the United States where the pediatrician sees jaundice, assumes it's fit the the unconjugated bilirubin jaundice from fetal red blood cells breaking down. And the recommendations in our, our country, which we're trying to pass, um, and it's obviously not followed well, is by two weeks, if there's jaundice still in the system, to fractionate that bilirubin. Now, when you get white stools on top of that, that, to me, is not only worrying, but it's super worrying, because by now, the stools have already turned white. So now you know you're 
well behind the game in a child that potentially might have obstruction of the bile ducts. And so you obviously have to work very, very quickly. So now um, simple slides that we've given to our audience that the first step, Sobhashokar got worried. Why was a uh, direct not asked? And in the second step, I did nothing. I didn't even talk to the parents. I examined the baby and I moved the diaper and here I go. So uh, Sanjeev is really, really worried. The key message is any jaundice beyond two weeks, please ask for total and direct bilirubin. Do not wait to, for the stools to be back. So how do you define neonatal cholestasis, Somashekar? Um, the, the recent, most recent definition of neonatal cholestasis, uh, according to Naspagan, is any conjugated hyperbilirubinemia in which the direct bilirubin is more than one milligram, provided the total bilirubin is less than five milligrams, or 20% of the total bilirubin if the bilirubin is more than five. You should have some dark color urine with or without clay stools. That's what I wanted to hint at. Yeah. That besides the direct bilirubin, look at the color of the urine with or without clay stools because you can have, as we said, rarely that. So there is controversy, but we will not confuse the pediatricians. We will say that more than one, if it is five, and more than 20% of the total, which will be. So, uh, Somshekar, without me doing a blood test on the child, you, we could have known that this was something to worry. Like in his patient, I opened up the diaper. So you agree that the next message we want to say is, please look at Yes, absolutely. We need to ask and inspect stool by ourselves and, you know, ask the parents or the grandparents for the color of the stool and whether there's any staining of the diaper. That is an important bedside tool, I would absolutely. say, to say it is a complicated hyper So even without pricking the child, Somersaker could have said that this is cholestasis. He would have seen the urine and uh, the stool. So we gave good messages to our pediatricians that yes, we all have talked about this Taiwan card and this is all supposed to be clear and what is pigmented is this. But sometimes you get mothers who do not get this, but a little even darker than this will call yellow. So what looks yellow to you may not look to me. So always better uh, to ask them to save the stool in some boxes and get to you. And it is the doctor who should see and uh, get convinced himself. So, uh, uh, what would be, Sanjeev, the key messages that you would give uh, if you found, uh, say, neonatal cholestasis? All that I know about this patient is this baby has direct bilirubin, and all that I'm showing you is the baby has clay stool. So, all that I said to you is neonatal cholestasis. So, from neonatal cholestasis, we know it could be neonatal hepatitis, it could be paucity of intrahepatic ducts, or it could be extrahepatic. In extrapatic, we think usually of biliary atresia or polydocal cyst. But if you are suspecting biliary atresia versus neonatal, what is the message you want to give for biliary atresia? When should I suspect? Right. So the message is very, very clear for a primary care doctor, which is, it's in my mind, it's biliary atresia until proven otherwise. And the reason why I say this is only one of the diagnoses you gave, of all the diagnoses you gave, requires immediate attention and correction. And that's biliary atresia. So if you're spending time deciding is it neonatal hepatitis or some other thing or some other thing, and you're not working quickly, then if it becomes biliary atresia, you're losing time and potentially losing that liver. So in my mind, in the way we teach here, is biliary atresia until proven otherwise with a high direct or conjugated bili, especially now with pale stools, this diagnosis has to be top on the list and it has to be excluded before doing anything else. Very beautifully said by Sanjeev. The data on 1,008 babies who were a multicentric study uh, published in Indian pediatrics in 2000. Then we showed that 33%, that means one in three babies have biliary atresia. So what we wanted to say is, he says, benefit of doubt, think about biliary atresia in all. But having said that, I agree to you. What is it, Somashekar, that worried you most when you think 
like a patient who comes with polystasis, where do you suspect more biliary atresia and more neonatal hepatitis? Some red eye something which you would look at? Yeah, I mean, usually the infant with biliary atresia is well looking. You know, you don't have a sick, you know, it's a well looking infant, and you know, you have a mild to moderate jaundice. And jaundice tends to, you know, uh, persist and they have pale stools. Whereas in a neonatal hepatitis, you have intermittently pale stools. So, and these children tend to have some sort of uh, abnormal livers, abnormal uh, you know, hepatomegaly, which is abnormal of consistency. Yeah, I, I think hepatomegaly can be there with both liver, spleen, all that. I, I would just take the key message which you said is the baby looks normal and gets neglected. That is the issue. And I appreciate Sanjeev, he's in that stage where he just doesn't want 0.1% error. So he says, unless otherwise, assume everybody, which is a stage ahead of us. But generally, we say the key message is if the baby is thriving. And when do you suspect neonatal hepatitis? Generally, please, yeah, sorry, San I leave Sanjeev to answer this. Sanjeev? Oh, go for, yeah, so we. Sanjeev is very dogmatic. He thinks everybody is willing. But Sanjeev, suppose you see something about the baby which you think a two months old baby, no, this is not looking biliary. What is that something? Yeah. So you, you can suspect neonatal hep in the studies that have been done, it, there's a predominantly male, um, males that get affected by this entity called neonatal hepatitis, which is still undefined and still under genetic investigation. Um, sometimes the GGT is lower. The AST and LT can be the same or maybe slightly higher. So I wanted an answer which was probably let me share that if you think you this child I opened up and I saw a beautiful haldi color, a turmeric color stool, then I would not have thought about malaria trees. So if you see okay. a bright pigmented, uh, you know, a haldi color stool, then I would not think. Or if you think that the baby was sick looking and history of some TPN, admission on unital, we jump, then we are, we, but I agree with what Sanjeev said. The blanket statement he wants to scare all of you, unless food otherwise, thing biliary, which I think is a beautiful message we are giving. But within that, we are trying to bet because parents will ask you, what are you thinking? So if you would have seen a pigmented nice tool at two months, I would have thought it to be less likely. But having said that, can liver enzymes help to differentiate biliary atresia versus neonatal hepatitis, Sanjeev? So the answer, the short answer is no, it can't. Um, GGT sometimes can be used, but I would caution heavily against that, um, of using liver enzymes to try to distinguish between um, these neonatal liver diseases. So again, I think if we use cutoffs like that blindly, we will get in trouble because there's going to be exceptions. Around 10% of cases of biliary atresia or lower will have GGTs less than 200, but the cutoff is usually 200. When we find a normal GGT, so in the 50s or around that way, in that range, then I think biliary atresia is very unlikely and we think of alternative, more specialized diagnoses that the pediatric hepatologist will help with. Right. So in general, the enzymes do not help to differentiate, but it is seen that in the early stages, the ALT is more, but if there is extensive fibrosis, AST would have set it, which you say you would see in metabolic. And as Sanjeev says, there has been another large paper which said that biliary atresia, none of the patients were less than 150. So generally, but we are giving you just a little idea. But if they are less than 150, you need to see the trend. And that's all. And I accept what uh, uh, Sanjeev said that you've got to. So now with this patient, I opened up, I saw this. So I'm going to ask what blood test, uh, Somshekar. I would do a, a complete LFT with the split bilirubin since it was not done. Uh, definitely with an alpha and, what else? and an albumin and an INR. Which is very, very good. And with the GGT, of course. So LFT, in, in, uh, at least in most good centers, includes GGT. But you're right, some labs don't do. So you said very dogmatically. And what was very important, you asked for an INR. 
along with the CBC, we should ask. Why? Because I don't know what I'm going to plan. Some people like to do the rule out the uh, treatable causes. But if you remember in my first slide, I said at birth she had ASH. Otherwise, yes, if the patient has not had treatable causes, you know, a TSH, uh, if it has not been done, or a urine reducing substance. In the first go, you also want to rule out any treatable causes in them. Plus, minus people like to do a urine routine or a CRP. That is, if they want to save a prick, that they want to rule out any UTI or sepsis or some infection. Generally, what he said, Soma Shekhar, a CBC, LFT, and INR is a must. If you think you don't want another prick, you want to add a urine a routine or a reducing substance and thyroid, fair enough because they are treatable. So I went ahead and I did this test. So my uh, bilirubin was 9.6 by 7 and uh, the OTPT was 566, 425, 272 was my GGT, albumin was still preserved 3.6. CRP was normal, INR was 1. We were lucky, but you all know that sometimes biliary atresia patients have, can present you with a bleed. I have a child admitted under me who actually went to the neurologist with a subdural hematoma and a bleed and was actually a case of cholestasis, but was missed. And so they can present you with bleed secondary to vitamin K deficiency. So this is what I basically like to do. And now that uh, we did this test, what is the other test you would want to do, which is at the same time, I am on 66 days. I didn't want to first do CVC, INR, I just wanted to be quick. And so what is the next test I would have done, Sanjeev? And we do an ultrasound very quickly to examine the gallbladder and look for any cyst or any other alternative reason that could be causing this picture. So three tests we do, pie typing for alpha-1 trypsin, chest x-ray for butterfly vertebrae, and ultrasound. Now this assumes, of course, the patient is otherwise healthy and has a normal INR. Okay, great. So I think uh, we do the ultrasound. We don't go straight away with an x-ray test. We would have done the ultrasound because ultrasound is a very good screening test, which I think you should tell the baby to go fasting. Because in a fasting ultrasound, if you see a good size gallbladder which contracts post feed, it is very useful. Otherwise, a contracted gallbladder could be seen in biliary atresia or otherwise, so it doesn't tell you. But do suggest them to go fasting maybe three hours, as you said. So in my patient, I asked for that. And the next day, they come to me with the toast test and an ultrasound, which was practically a small... Uh, a gallbladder with 0.1 cc and that, that's all, no difference. So what next, should I go for a HIDA scan? So Mushekar, are you back? Poison. Should I go for a HIDA scan or a straight away liver biopsy? So from, the answer is clear on this. There's no need to do a HIDA scan at all on this patient. Mm -hmm. so, so the patient the patient has white stools. So we already know bile is not getting from the intestine, from the liver to the intestine. So a HIDA scan won't show you much. A HIDA scan uses time. It takes time away from the treatment of this patient because usually it takes three or four or many days to, 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 to do. And then on top of that, HIDA scan has a notorious false positive rate. So if you get an abnormal HIDA scan, it doesn't mean it's biliary atresia. So in most of our practice in the U.S., the HIDA scan is kind of an archaic test that's not used in the diagnosis of these children. Right. Yeah. So absolutely, this is a message to the pediatricians. We have given a recommendation in Indian pediatrics last two years back. If you have the luxury of a patient coming to you by say three, four weeks, go ahead, do a HIDA scan if you want by giving phenobarbitone and ursodeoxycholagusid, especially phenobarbitone five days. But this child, is coming to you at 66 days. And as Sanjeev said, I don't want to waste time. Sanjeev said, rightly, the stools were clear what information I will get. So I will proceed with the liver biopsy. And that's why we should not waste our time with HIDA scan. And liver biopsy, how does it help you, Sanjeev? What all information? So this, this process is changing um, as we speak. 
A liver biopsy generally can help you look for signs of biliary atresia, which are signs of generic obstruction of the liver, which this includes scarring of the liver, and sometimes the bile ducts inside the liver also start proliferating, dividing. So we can see these signs to look for biliary atresia. More importantly, perhaps, we can look for things that would suggest another diagnosis. Like if we see lack of bile ducts, we might think another diagnosis like allergial syndrome. So you can, as, uh, as he said, A, you can diagnose biliary atresia, you can diagnose positive bile ducts, you can look for CMV, uh, uh, you know, staining if it is available, you can prognosticate what is the extent of fibrosis you can talk about. And sometimes in metabolic disorders, if you are lucky, you can pick up certain metabolic disorders also. Some people claim that they can give some comments on tyrosinemia, hemochromatosis, iron deposit. That's a luxury we won't discuss. But besides that luxury, the basic things that we think about, biliary, paucity, CMV, prognosis, fibrosis, all this we can tell. So it's a beautiful bet to go ahead. And I went ahead with uh, uh, this and it was suggestive of biliary atresia with grade four fibrosis. So, Sanjeev, what should I do? Kasai or liver transplant? Okay. So, um, this question also is, um, in my mind, in con not con is not controversial, but across the world it is. My mind is to take the left side, go for the Kasai surgery. This is the only chance this child has of avoiding liver transplant. Now, I must say there was a recent case published just recently where they had a patient with biliary trees that, that didn't get a Kasai and lived up to four years of age. But typically, your child will die by the first year or the second year without a Kasai surgery. Now, the Kasai should be considered an intermediary surgery in many cases as a bridge to transplant. But so, right now, the message was to the uh, pediatricians, in this patient, the, the patient was not cirrhotic. The fibrosis was grade four by six and albumin was 3.6. And so still there was no ascites in ultrasound and the patient deserves a Kasai. However, if this patient was little older or had a cirrhotic liver or an albumin, which was somewhere around three-ish, or, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, in this scenario, then you should have thought because we have smart parents uh, who will discuss because the outcome of liver transplant in a patient who underwent Kasai is also a problematic, which we will take as we move. So in this patient, no doubt, we want to go for Kasai because the synthetic function was good and there was no cirrhosis but not for all patients that's what we want to give message if somebody goes beyond 90 days somebody is decompensated cirrhotic site is seen in ultrasound please do not subject to kasai un, uh, without asking whether they can go in for transplant if they say no 100 percent we don't want to go then uh, 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 type 1 and 2 are 10% and you can take a chance. Otherwise, no chance. So we did a Kasai photoentrostomy. Within three days, as you notice, patient from 66 days, 67 days, uh, uh, the reports were done. Biopsy next today, and we gave the report of the biopsy the same evening next day posted for surgery. So that's another message I'm giving to audience. Don't sit over your cases. One week for HIDA, one week for ultrasound, one week for biopsy. No. You saw I did everything in less than 36 hours. Even surgery was done. So that is another message that we want to give. So now what happens is, Sanjeev, uh, the three weeks, the bilirubin is actually 8.3 and 6.5. But at five weeks, it's 3.8 and 3. So what I did, to be honest to you, at three weeks, I started steroids. I don't know whether it, the steroids work, but what is your thoughts and USA thoughts on steroids after the acute phase? Uh, so, so steroids are, 
very controversial. So the largest randomized controlled trial, the best type of study we have in medicine, said steroids don't work, and in fact, they um, can lead to increased complications. When we say don't work, it means they didn't help avoid liver transplant with the Kasai. Saying that, even though that data is out there, in many centers across the country, not ours, but in many centers across the U.S., people do use steroids at different times with some idea of trying to help the, uh, the liver recover. So I think the data, it would be unfair for me to say that don't use it, um, but I would say the random, randomized control trial, the definitive trial says don't use it, right. and we do not use it. Controversy goes on. I went for my training in 97, 98, and the controversy was there. We were doing the steroid studies. So my message is, unless until you're very comfortable that there is no cholangitis, unless until you are very comfortable, don't use it. In this patient, the counts were okay, the CRP was less than five, the baby looked okay, and the enzymes was... So I took a chance, but I agree, I don't use steroids in all, and both of us gave our thoughts about steroids, whether it worked or not. But now it is five weeks. So what would you call this patient? No response, partial response, good response, what do you call? So when I look at... When I look at this this liver panel and these results, this table, I would say we are in a, a very good trajectory. Now, you might say, well, look at all the liver numbers. What's wrong with them? I mean, they're all going up except one. It turns out that one number is the most, the best indicator of success, and that's the bill D, direct billy. It went from 5.7 to 6.5, and now it's at 3. So we're on a very nice trajectory to say that the billy ribbons becoming normal. Now, a lot of people might get concerned about that GGT sitting there, 2086. And the GGT at 2086 could be concerning. However, we do see the GGT going up in biliary atresia when the bile ducts are recovering. So it might be a good sign, it might be a bad sign. But the direct ability tells me things are going well. Okay, so I guess in general, we uh, like to give simple messages to pediatrician. I would say three messages. One, no response, whatever your bilirubin was, it's hovering there only. So if I started with 9.8, I'm still around. Partial response, I think this looks like a partial, but the dictum is, in general in India, we say that wait till three months to see where you go. So right now, to me, to call it partial or uh, a good response, I need a few weeks to go. So I'm going to tell my mother, I'm happy that at five weeks it has come down. I can't say there is partial or complete response. Let me see you for a few weeks more. And at the end of three months, I will tell her, is this partial, is this no, or is this complete response? Now, when do you suggest liver transplant uh, to a patient? Suppose this patient who's right now five weeks. If the mother wants to know, Doctor, when do you think this is working and not working, and when do you suggest liver transplant? So by three months, typically, six months, definitely, if the conjugated bilirubin hasn't corrected, uh, it's time to think about liver transplant. That's the best indication that the Kasai has worked or not worked, is the, the bilirubin. So it's actually a simple answer, um, which is by three to six months if the conjugated bilirubin hasn't corrected to normal. Right. So do you uh, take a normal or at three months if somebody has a bilirubin say of six, uh, can we say that yes, now it does not work? Yeah, so a bilirubin at six, a direct bilirubin or even a total bilirubin at six, there's a, there's a gray zone like everything. And the way we've sort of divided it is less than two means success. Two to six is a question mark and greater than six in total bilirubin, it's not going to work. So if you're between the two to six range at three months of uh, three months after Kasai, then it may or may not do well. If you're above six, it's not going to do well according to the to a large cohort. We and if you're less than six, but like you know, pseudo cyst, we've thrown away six, six, six like that. But right now we are quite fond of just explaining that if it is more than six by three months, it won't settle. So that is an idea you would give. Uh, to that. So now I wanted to ask you that, uh, Pastor, I think we need to go to the second case also. So that is it. Right now it is difficult, but yes, 
indication is varicose eye and varicose cholangitis and portal hypertension. Now, what is very interesting is bilirubin atresia patients uh, can sometimes have very bad portal hypertension even with a uh, bilirubin which is three. So this is also very important to understand that babies are different. Like you should not say Neelam has told me that only if the bilirubin and Sajeev has said no, but sometimes if you have florid portal hypertension with spinomegaly ascites, bleeding, then obviously the patient will need a, a transplant. So you need to understand. And sometimes we talk about the extrapatic complications like hepatopulmonary syndrome and those patients with bilirubin That means you're having breathing issues, oxygen maintaining, then you need a transplant. So um, I wanted to go back really just to just rewind and summary, summarize the, the colored stool concept, which is that was a big point. If the stools are not colored, we think biliary atresia or we have to work up further. Now, I want to give just really quickly share the data because I think we can all think about it from Taiwan and Japan who have been doing the stool color card systematically since around the 1980s in some provinces. So with the stool color card, by 45 days of life, only 80% of children with the biliary atresia will have pale stools. So pale stools is something that occurs gradually. Now by 60 days of life, 97.1% of children will have pale stools. This baby was 66 days, like you said. But I want to emphasize to the group that pale stools are something that occurs gradually over time. So if someone says at 30 days of life, my baby's stools were colored, it doesn't mean they don't have biliary atresia. It's important to continually ask this question. Basically, the message which Sajeev is giving is there are two types of biliary atresia. One, we say the syndromic variety, which is only 10-15%, which starts in utero probably, and you might have other features of uh, multiple spliniculi, situs inverses and all. In those patients, yes, they are very early. They will have all the features which, you know, typical pale stools, cholestasis, etc. But what Sanjeev wanted to highlight is the rest of the patient. It's an uh, ongoing process. Because it's an ongoing process of fibrosis that is occurring biliary atresia, which did not be complete only in, in utero. It might be progressive uh, uh, post uh, delivery. Therefore, that is why we are harping and giving you the message that you, buy, you must detect early because those patients where the progression was happening gradually and has beautifully highlighted that 99% will go by two months. And now most studies, even the French studies are showing that the outcome is better if you did it in 30 days. In India, we are talking 90 days, some uh, you know, few uh, years back, but I think it is time for our experts to give the message to this audience that it is not 90. We said 90 because you were giving us 120 days. The mean, uh, in 2000, the statistics of 1008 babies was uh, was referenced at 120 days. We wanted to reduce it and we said 90, but it is time you people have understood. So we want to ask you more. We want to say, give us at 45 days or, uh, you know, and we are not even happy with 60. We want 45 and maybe after some time we'll tell you 30. And, uh, and I, I, I apologize on behalf of uh, Soma Shekhar. Sadly, there was a little bit of uh, a, a problem at his house uh, and he had to leave in between and I apologize on his behalf. But thank you, Sanjeev, for taking it over. And yeah. uh, I'm glad we took one case, but we gave crystal clear messages to our uh, audience. And Sanjeev, you were very informative and highlighting those points uh, on bilirubin uh, which is absolutely, as you said, the most common cause of transplant, as well as, you know, something which we all really feel upset that why we couldn't take care of these kids earlier. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. And thank you, Sanjeev, so much. This is a very excellent discussion.